Hi, welcome to True Creeps, where the stories are true and the creeps are real. We'll cover stories from grotesque gore to the possibly plausible paranormal, to horrifying history, to tense and terrible true crime, and everything else that goes bump in the night. We're your hosts, Amanda. And I'm Lindsay. And we want you to join us while we creep. We cover mature topics. Listener discretion is advised. Hey, everybody. Today, we're going to be talking about the tube sock killings, which sounds like an interesting and strange name for a series of murders, but it makes sense. Yes. When you know that some of the victims were found with tube socks tied around their neck. Horrible. Horrible. Also very bizarre and random. Yeah. Uh, what a, an interesting object. And I had never heard of this case before our jam cat, which is one of our patrons, Mary, recommended it to us. Yes. And we were like, oh, that's an interesting one. Let's let's take a look. And then we just we fell deep into a hole, which is our favorite. We did. Sorry if you hear Moose snoring, by the way. She is snoring loud. <laughs> Yes. So thank you so much, Mary, for sending us the request and for being a jam cat. Yes. Yes. And to all of our patrons. So we're just going to jump right into our case. So the first victims were Stephen Harkins and his girlfriend, Ruth Cooper, and unfortunately, their dog as well. They lived in Tacoma, Washington, and they were headed out for a quick camping trip on the weekend of August 10th of 1985. And where they were going was it was called Tool Lake in Pierce County. That area, too, from when I was looking at it, is so pretty. Oh, it is so pretty. Also, we're doing a lot around lakes right now. We are. We did Lava Lake. It just happened that way. Yeah. And then there's another commonality that we'll talk about in a bit. That was like the research that Amanda had done a while ago had to do with this. So unfortunately, neither Ruth nor Stephen returned from this camping trip. And they didn't make it to school on Monday. And they were both attending trade school together. So when their families found out that, you know, they weren't showing up to work, they weren't showing up to school and people hadn't seen them, they were like, OK, we're going to file a missing persons report. Yeah. And then pretty soon after, on August 14th of 1985, hikers were passing through the area where Stephen and Ruth had been camping and they discovered a body. They alerted the authorities who identified the body as Stevens. He had been shot in the head. Authorities believe that it had happened in his sleep because he was still like tucked into his sleeping bag. That's horrible. That's so sad. Horrible. Yeah. As authorities searched the area, they also found that his dog had been shot to death. Don't like that either. No. They also could not find Ruth. A little over two months later, on October 26th, hikers found a skull at the end of 8th Avenue near Hearts Lake. And this is about a mile and a half from where Stephen's body was found. I was like pinpointing things on a map just because I wanted to see where things were in relation to each other. Because often when you're reading sources, what they leave out is like actual distance. Like here it says like a mile and a half, but we'll get to a point where they're like, here's this other related incident. Maybe this is the same. And it's like to get an idea of that area, especially because we're not there. But it's interesting that they mentioned that it's near Hearts Lake because it's the end of this road is basically parallel to Tool Lake. So... Police were able to confirm that the skull was Ruth through her dental records, but they didn't find the rest of her body at first. So then two days later, on October 28th, Ruth's body was found, and it was about 50 feet away from where the skull was, which I found confusing, because wouldn't you look at, like, the surrounding area? The immediate surrounding area? Like, 50 feet is not very far. Unless it was, like, under something. I thought that, too, when I was looking at the details, and I was like, that's really weird. My only thought is it had to have been, like, underbrush or, like... I don't know, somewhere hard to see for whatever reason. Yeah, I guess. But I'm like, that's just still weird. Yeah. When they found her body, one of the things that they noticed was that a tube sock had been wrapped around her neck. And so it wasn't just wrapped around it. There was also like a knot as well. Yeah. Her autopsy later showed that her cause of death as homicidal violence, which just feels like a little bit dramatic for a police or medical report. That feels strange and vague. But so a police spokesperson clarified later and that said that she had been shot in the abdomen so we have steven who was shot in the head in the head while he was possibly sleeping and then we find ruth pretty far away i mean i think a mile and a half is pretty far away for a person's body to be found you could drive there but like strange either like making her walk with them and then murdering her or having to like carry the body that far it like seems just strange Yes, agreed. Unless what you were trying to do was get some distance between you and the campsite. Yeah. A gunshot's not a quiet sound. 
No, not at all. And especially, too, because of the dog as well. Yes. Again, we mentioned this area is beautiful. It's mid-August. It'd be weird if they were the only people who were camping here. Mm -hmm. It's not that far and that remote where it would be strange that other people might be there. Right. So as part of our research, we looked through Reddit and we also read the comments on the articles that we're reading. Because sometimes there's just like a lot of people's conjecture and theories and like those are interesting and like we'll you know read through to be like what should we cover what kind of questions do people ask about this case we saw from people who were relatives of the victims in the case pretty frequently throughout like the reddit posts more than i would say that we normally do when we say it was from a relative we say that the person was reporting that they were a relative does that mean it was actually them no as we describe them we'll typically say something to the effect of a person claiming to be, right? So a person claiming to be Stephen's niece commented that their family had an incredibly difficult time trying to get any information from police regarding their investigation. Basically, they just kept telling them, it's an open case, we can't tell you anything. But it seemed like they weren't really doing anything. And we'll also notice a pattern from Washington law enforcement where families are having to push them to take steps that seem pretty reasonable It seems like they take big leaps in in logic and that they aren't necessarily as motivated. I feel like most of the time in missing persons cases, we're always like, there more could be done. But it's, yeah, just strange. So that's our first set of victims, Stephen and Ruth. Right. So the second set of victims was Mike Reamer and his girlfriend, Diana Robertson. And luckily, this next person was okay, but still a victim. Their two-year-old daughter, Crystal Robertson. So... Let's talk a little bit about the background. They were also from Tacoma, Washington. And the couple had met four years prior when Diana was 17 and Michael was 36. Lindsay's face. We're making yikes faces. So Mike worked as a trapper and a roofer. And it's interesting that you mentioned that he was a trapper because in our Lava Lake episode, they were literally just trappers. I have never thought about how people are doing fur traps in my life ever because I don't want to. And it's sad. Right. Now that's knowledge that we have. It's not like you set like four traps. You set a bunch of traps and then you have to go out and check them regularly Mm -hmm. because you don't want the hides to be messed up. Right. And for humane reasons. Right. And you have to remember where they are in the middle of the forest. Continue to check on them. Continue to reset them up if they go off for random reasons. A lot of work. Yeah. So they went near the Nisqually River in Pierce County on December 12th of 1985. Some sources say, too, that they were camping, but others, like Unsolved Mysteries, say it was a day trip to go look for a Christmas tree. So they were just in that area. Could be for the day, could be overnight. But we didn't see any discussions of camping gear. And it was winter, so it seems likely that it was probably just the day trip. While they were out, Mike planned on checking on some of his traps in the area. Makes sense. He's out there. Why not? Later that afternoon, so that same day on the 12th, Little Crystal was found at a Kmart store, and shoppers located the little girl all alone and called police. Law enforcement then took Crystal to be examined at the hospital, obviously to make sure she was okay. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't initially find her parents, so they're like, we don't know what to do with this little girl. So they didn't know, obviously, who she belonged to. So they put her in foster care, and then they started sharing her picture on the news to try to figure out who her family was. And unfortunately, that's the thing that happens, and it took two or three days for them to figure it out. Crystal's maternal grandmother, Louise Conrad, saw the news and was able to identify who Crystal was. When Louise came to pick Crystal up, she immediately said, Grandma, when she saw Louise. So that's a good sign. The kid recognizes her and feels safe. So she asked Crystal, of course, where's your mom? And she answered, Mommy is in the trees. It gives me shivers. Like, I don't like it. It's sad, but it's also very ominous. And honestly, a two-year-old trying to describe something in general is ominous because they say weird shit. Yeah, fair. (laughs) So investigators said that she was too young to properly verbalize the needed information. It makes sense because a two-year-old is not really going to be able to describe in detail much of anything. Yeah. I see it. But in the trees, I mean, in two-year-old speak, that normally means forest, right? Yeah. So authorities began searching for Mike and Diana. And they were trying to track down where the couple's pickup truck would have been because they were hoping to locate them. If they were able to find the vehicle, hopefully they would be there or nearby. Fair. And they were searching for a 1982 Plymouth pickup truck. So I'm sure that was probably on the news, just trying to figure out where they could have been. 
In addition to authorities searching, Mike's best friend, Steve, too, was also searching and following Mike's trap plan. And he was doing this on the ground and from the air. And Mike typically had hundreds of traps set up. So it makes sense that he would need to, like, map out where all of them were. Mm -hmm. And his friend probably went with him, you know, to check on traps before. So he probably had a good idea. And what he usually trapped for, which I was like, oh, my gosh, some of these are big. He trapped bobcats, minks, coyotes, and muskrats. What he's trapping that makes me go like, oh, of course people have copies of his trap map. I would imagine that that would be something that you trusted a lot. Because otherwise, you're just like, here's where my money is. Yeah. It's good that he had somebody who had that plan so that they could search in those areas. No, that that totally makes sense. So Mike's father, Lloyd Reamer, who was 78 at the time, also searched for his son every day, which breaks my heart. Unfortunately, they had nothing for two months. Then, on February 18th of 1986, Diana's body was found by a man who was walking his dog deep in the forest near Elb, Washington. Her body was found in the forest laying next to Mike's truck. What's really interesting is that when you look for an exact location of this, it's pretty hard to find. Yeah. We'll talk later about a descriptor that eventually gets tacked on so that you can kind of have a sense of where it is. But there's not a lot of information about where she is other than she's in a forest and it's near Elb. Right. Diana also had a tube sock tied around her neck. So we now have our second murder of a woman where she has a tube sock tied around her neck. And an extra detail here is that it's tied in the same way that it was around Ruth's neck. So while the tube sock is relatively unique, I don't think the knot part necessarily is because there's only so many types of knots you could use with a material like that with that much space. I think that when they're linking Ruth and Diana, because they're the people who were found with tube socks around their neck, They're like, this must be the same person because they're bringing these tube socks. But I don't think that 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 we know that that's true. It could be that it's a found object. It could be that tube socks were popular in this time period. A lot of people were wearing them. It could just be an object that was close by that was being used as a ligature. I don't know. I'm not convinced that they're necessarily the same because the socks weren't from the same batch. Right. Today, if you buy tube socks... They're not really as popular. So you buy like a pack of like one or two typically. And I called my mom and I was like, hey, mom, I have the random, the most random question for you. She was like, OK. And I was like, did you wear tube socks in the 80s? And she was like, no. And I was like, OK. In 1985, were tube socks sold in packs? And she was like, that was before you were born. And I'm like, I am aware of the year I was born. <laughs> yes, that is true. This was before I was born. But she was like, I think they were. I think that you could buy a pack of tube socks. So then she, she was like, but Google it. So like I, I looked and I was like, yeah, you can see you can see packs of tube socks where there's like six of them, like six pairs in there. So I feel like and not that like everybody has only one pack of socks. Most people, when it comes to socks, like you stick to like your common brand. I keep my same age socks together. If that makes sense. Like the pair that they come in is the, the pair that they stay in so that they're similarly aged. And maybe that's a me weird thing. <laughs> But like because of that, it means that socks from the same batch are like what I'm wearing. But they like they looked at the manufacturer of the sock and they could tell that they weren't created in the same batch. So they weren't part of the same pack. Right. And I think what you also mean is like if this person was going and killing multiple people, right, that they would likely have one of the socks from the same pack. It's not like they would go and buy a new pack and go, I'm going to go kill someone today. If they came in multiples, socks come in multiples. Yeah. It likely would have been the same pack. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Did I take the longest way to explain that? Yes. But that's that is what I'm saying is that like, what are the odds that they're going to have several packs of socks that are from different batches that they're putting around people's necks? Okay. But getting back to how they found Diana in the autopsy, they found that she had been stabbed 17 times, which is much different than a gunshot wound with our first couple as well. Mm hmm. And at this point in time, they don't give you an exact or exact ish location, but we do hear that she's about 15 miles from where Stephen and Ruth were found. And also, just as a note, Stephen and Ruth, where they were found, was a place that was on the trapping map for Mike. Like he had traps set up around that area. So he did know that area, too. Right. And also, like, we're thinking if he has hundreds of traps in that area, he probably knows a lot of that space. Fair. 
Yeah. So they found Diana next to his truck, which means that they found the truck as well. And inside the truck, they found a handwritten note on a manila envelope that said, I love you, comma, Diana. That comma is important so that you know it's not I love you, period, like dash Diana. Like it's like I love you, Diana. Right. So they're talking to Diana. According to Diana's mom, the note was written by Mike. And she thinks that because she'd seen his handwriting on cards and that like that's the way he would write I love you on things like I love you, Diana, not just like love you or something like that. Like it was a common way that he phrased it. Right. Authorities, however, were unsure who wrote the note and the FBI analysis on the handwriting came back as inconclusive. Another thing that just kind of sticks out to them is that it's not like they just find this in the truck, among other things. It's placed in a really prominent space, so it looks like it's trying to be displayed. And they're like, why is this here? Right. And police wonder, could it be the final goodbye from Mike, or it was possibly something left there so that he could throw off authorities so that they thought that. I also saw, like, some people who postulated that whomever was doing whatever was like, you can write them a note. And then, like, that he did that. Inside the truck, there were also bloodstains on the seat. And we will include a link for that in our show notes so that you can see them. It's an old photo. It's it's a little hard to see, but you clearly see what it is. Yeah. I'm not a blood spatter expert, but it doesn't look like blood that came from someone when they were injured or murdered. It looks almost like it's wiped on the seat. Right. It looks like it was like if you were to clean up a t- with a towel, a lot of blood and sit the towel on there and then grab the towel off. But I guess there's no streak. Well, there's a little bit of streaks. Actually, you know what it makes me think of? It makes me think they took the knife on one side and then on the other side. Maybe because some of it comes downwards and then some of it comes down towards like the back of the seat. So like the runoff doesn't match. So it's very strange. It's actually a weird placement. Yeah. And so Detective David Neiser said that they were unable to pull DNA from that blood, which is unfortunate. And he said, unfortunately, after two months and about two weeks, some of the characteristics of the blood were lost and they were not able to tell us what the type of blood was, but they were able to tell us the blood was human. That's a bummer. It's a bummer. This is his truck that he uses to pick up animals that he traps. Right. So knowing the difference is good, at least. So, okay, we have our first set of victims and now we have Diana, but we don't know where Mike is. Right. And when police can't find him or his remains, they begin to suspect that maybe he killed Diana. There are some problems with this story. And the first is that it's, it would be unclear what his motive was, like why he would have done it. But it's also unclear how he would have gotten Crystal to that Kmart and gotten back because it was 30 miles away, first off. And then also, remember, his truck was found at the scene where Diana was. So, like, he would have been driving to and back. Right. One of the sources that we read today has a person who claims to be Crystal responding to comments. Maybe I'm naive. I actually do think it's her the way that she responds to things. One of the things that she responded to was saying that she didn't remember who had taken her. And a lot of people are like, well, if your father would have taken you, wouldn't you have remembered? And I do think that's a good point that like she said, like, mommy's in the trees. Right. I feel like if somebody was like, where are your parents? She's like, my daddy took me here. My mommy's in the trees. Like, there's a lot of things you wouldn't remember, but you would likely remember that it was your dad. I think so. Even a two-year-old would say, like, dad took me here. Dad left me here. You know, like, they'd be upset. They drove without me. Yeah. Little kids narc, man. But anyway, the other discovery that police had made was that Mike had a domestic assault charge that Diana had filed against him on October 19th of 1985. So just a couple months before... And they had split up during that time, but they got back together right before that trip in December. And according to Darlene Robertson, Diana's sister, he had a history of domestic violence and frequently beat her up, which is devastating and very sad. That's really sad. So, like, I can see why they're why they're looking at him for this. Yeah. Law enforcement had enough circumstantial evidence to issue a warrant for his arrest in relation to Diana's murder, but they weren't sure whether he was alive or not. So we now have Diana who is found in a similar manner to Ruth, and Mike, who is nowhere. So police begin to wonder, okay, if he killed Diana and she has this novel piece of evidence on her, is it the same murderer as Stephen and Ruth? As they're investigating his involvement in Diana's murder, they begin to wonder whether he's actually a serial killer. 
And then they think, okay, is he responsible for Stephen and Ruth's death as well? And that's because Ruth and Diana were both found with a tube sock on their neck. So they're like, this has to be the same person because this is a novel way of finding people. And it's also relatively close and relatively close in time, too. It's just within a few months of each other. So some begin to wonder if he's also involved in a set of murders that occurred before Stephen and Ruth were murdered. Right. And those are the murders of Kimberly, Diane Levine, and Edward Smith. And here's a little bit of background on them, too. On the Parents of Murdered Children's website, Kimberly's parent writes about Kimberly and the circumstances of Ed and Kimberly's deaths, as well as the investigation. It's pretty clear that they do not think that investigators did a good job of investigating the disappearance and murder of their daughter. Kimberly was one of six children and was the first daughter to her parents. Her parent also shared that she was incredibly independent, even from a young age. And something that we thought was really sweet is they told a story of when Kimberly started kindergarten. And Kimberly's mother went like the day before and was like, here's the path that you're going to take to kindergarten. Like, aren't we so excited? It's going to be great. Shows her where to walk, what to do, all of that. And then so the first day of kindergarten comes up and they're about to leave for this first day. And Kimberly's like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to walk by myself. I know the way. And like, didn't want the help like walking to kindergarten, which is bizarre for like such a little girl. Normally, I know my son was like, please don't leave me. But that's that's adorable that she was just like, I got this. Yeah. I'm yeah. She's like, I am a you woman of the me. world now. Yeah. Yeah. You showed me once. Don't show me again. What am I, five? Get out of here. <laughs> so we just thought that was sweet to share. A little bit more about Kimberly, though. After high school, she enlisted in the U.S. Air Force and she was stationed in North Carolina and Guam. She had training in aircraft air conditioning and refrigeration. After the military, she went to the University of Southeastern Massachusetts at Dartmouth to study accounting, and that's where she met Ed. After graduation, the pair moved to Seattle, Washington, because Kimberly got a job at a government accounting agency there. So, I mean, that makes sense. It's a good job. So they move over. So although they heard from Kimberly in phone calls and letters, the last time that Kimberly's parents actually saw her was before she left for Washington, which is really sad. Yeah. It's also like that starting of your life after school is like such an exciting time because you feel like you're actually getting to start to live the life you've worked for and like building it. She was just about to like really start her life. Right. And that hurts my heart. Yeah. And I mean, she was independent, too. So she's probably like, I got mm-hmm. this. I'll let you know when I'm successful. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, her and Ed, by the way, not just her. Yeah. So they were planning on getting married. So Kimberly and Ed in the summer of 1985 back in the Northeast so that their families would also be able to be there. On March 9th of 1985, they left for a weekend getaway to Grant County. Again, some sources say that it was just a day trip, but same story as the other ones, right? They left for either a weekend or the day. When they didn't report back to work on the 11th, a limited search was conducted. However, very interesting, on the 10th, so the day before that, Ed's body was found, but it wasn't identified as Ed for a few days, which is interesting. You would think like, we have a body, connect the two quickly. I don't know. You would think on the 11th, they're like, here are the unidentified bodies in this area. Right. Is it this one we've already found? Right. Strange. But Ed had been found in a gravel pit near the Wanapum Dam. Which is very, very sad. Even worse, his hands had been bound behind his back and his throat had been cut. And this was about three hours from the area of the previous murders that we discussed. So it's very interesting that people tie these together because this is an entirely different type of death. And three hours between murders is a pretty big distance for. A lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them. Yeah. And there's like not some reason to tie these areas together. Right. It's not like people were like, they knew each other. Right. Or they had beef or something. No, it was just couples. Like that's the only thing that is the parallel is, yeah, it's each of them are couples. So a couple of weeks after they had originally left, their car was found at an overlook. And in August of 1985, Kimberly's remains were found in a sage bush near where Ed had been found, which, again, like from March to August, if she was close to where he had been found, you would hope that they would do better looking, like to, to find anything else. 
And then that makes me question investigators quite a bit. Well, exactly. And when you're when we're looking at that article that was written by one of Kimberly's parents, we used the word limited search a few minutes ago because that's the word they used was that they did a limited search. They were not spending like a lot of resources or time looking for them. And yeah, that's very worrisome and very, very sad that one, like Kimberly's family had no idea where she was, if she was still alive, if she wasn't. And then also like she was right there, like she wasn't very far. And on top of that, they're like 3000 miles away. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just a a big difference, though, between March and August, I think, at least. Mm -hmm. So in 1989, police found a single fingerprint on their car and they matched it to a man named Billy Ray Bullard. My immediate question is, four years, four years to find a fingerprint on their car. Yeah, that's a that's a long time. And I mean, think about it. Like, if they couldn't even search a little area, right, for her remains, like, that just shows you how slow they were moving at this. And I'm sure there's obviously a lot of stuff. There's a lot of things that go in the background between this. But like, that's still a very, very long time. It's a little bit unclear when you're reading about this if they had pulled that fingerprint and then it took four years for them to find a match or if it took four years for them to find the fingerprint. Right. So when they you know, figured out where Billy Ray Ballard was, he was serving time in Wyoming and that's when his fingerprints were matched. Bob Levine, Kimberly's father, reported that he had to pressure the Washington prosecutors, to extradite Bullard for the trial and that they were incredibly persistent. So he even went as far to say that they wouldn't have given any information if they weren't constantly calling them. So like him and Kimberly's mom were both like, no, you guys need to do something. You need to extradite him. This needs to happen. And that makes me really sad because I feel like that's the case for so many people, right? Even right now. Meanwhile, there's big cases out there like we just extradited Lori Vallow here, right? And that seems easy. I wonder if she would be extradited if her case wasn't receiving so much attention. Mm -hmm. You're always thinking about elections and who's in charge of who's getting things. And those are elected positions. And when you can see like a big noteworthy case getting movement, like it's good for people who are trying to get reelected or get elected to a different position or something like that. Like there's other things that go into it other than just did this person commit a crime and do we have enough evidence to charge them? Right, right. I hate it. It's awful. And same thing like when we're talking about them finding the bodies, there's several cases that we've been talking about in our True Crime Digest that aren't getting the attention that they deserve. And they're finding pieces that can help figure out what happened to them later rather than Mm -hmm. initial investigations, which is horrific. But luckily, they were persistent. They were able to do this, right? So let's talk a little bit about Billy Ray Bullard Jr., And he worked as a truck driver, which I know we've talked about truck drivers being part of a lot of these murders in the past, right? Like, because it's an easy way to, like, travel around without really being looked at twice. Yeah. So, like we said before, when they matched the fingerprint to him, he was already serving time in Wyoming in a prison for several offenses. Specifically, he had been convicted of abducting, torturing, and raping two women from Wyoming. He did not murder them, though, which still like, oh, my gosh, that's awful. Terrible. But I think that what some people are like, okay, but like, is that different from what he did here? Because he didn't kill them. And I'm like, "Mm, I don't know. Right. You were well on your way there. You know, like if you could do the other things, it's not a huge leap to murder for me. No, not at all. That's like the first one. And then you see it like escalate each time. So I will say, though, that the view of rape and how serious it is has seriously changed in the past almost 40 years. So there was a point when people were like, a person was just raped. Yes, that's true. Even even now you hear people be like, but why should he go to prison? It'll ruin his entire life. Well, like a guy rapes someone. It's like, do you think that you did not cause serious damage to the other person's life that you assaulted? Right. And you changed their life forever from that point too. Yeah. Well, you did it. That's true. That's true. So he did plead guilty to the murders and he was sentenced to life in prison. And he pled guilty to get the death penalty off the table. So on Reddit, one of Ballard's siblings said that he didn't commit the murders. So the sibling also said that he was not the type to like hurt someone. So it just seemed like that was out of the question. But also he 
raped people. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's confusing. That seems like torturing and raping is pretty... I agree. I don't really trust the sibling too much. But anyways, the sibling continued that Ballard didn't even hunt with him and his brothers. So like, if he couldn't hurt an animal, he couldn't possibly hurt a person, which still, bleh, no. Yeah. And so another part of it that they mentioned is that Ballard was part of a biker club. And if someone else like within this club would have possibly done the murders, he wouldn't be the one to like rat them out, like the the biker brothers out. So perhaps he was covering for someone. Yeah. What they kind of also say, too, is they, they know that like they don't say that he probably wasn't there, just that like he wasn't the one that did it. So it's like it's possible like that's why his fingerprint was there, because he was present, just not the person who was carrying out the murders. Yeah. I mean, but still being present and letting it happen is pretty bad pretty bad yeah not not great it's not great yeah it's pretty bad so they also said that he was dabbling with hallucinogenics so he may have done it while he was under the influence which still like isn't a get out of jail free card right like that's still you did something bad lastly they also said that ballard told them that he didn't do it but that his lawyer said that he was facing the death penalty so that's why he pled guilty to like avoid the death penalty which okay fair but like I don't know, just his background doesn't seem like he's like totally innocent, right? There's some alarming facts that are going on that make me concerned about whether everything it was him or whether he was present or just involved in some way. Like he's in the mix in some way. Yes, yes, agreed, agreed. When I say that he's in the mix in some way, I feel very confident that he is not involved in the murders three hours away that we are talking about today. I don't think Kimberly and Ed's murders have anything to do with the murders of Diana, Stephen, and Ruth. No, I mean, and they're so different. Yeah. So police are looking for Mike for a pretty long time. And during this time, some other theories emerge. And the first I find very interesting, and it brings up another kind of, I don't know, coincidence. Mm -hmm. But friends of Stephen said that a man whom none of them knew, showed up at a wedding that the friends and Stephen had attended. And they said that this unidentified man was very angry and he kept asking about Stephen. And when they were like, why are you so mad? The unidentified man said that Stephen had caused damage to his motorcycle. And this kind of just fizzled out. They never really followed it up on it. My initial reaction to this was, it seems like a big reaction to shoot someone in the head and then like, and then like kill their dog and then also kill their girlfriend because someone damaged your motorcycle. But then we think back to that Billy was in that motorcycle club. That's an interesting connection. That makes me think those are perhaps related. But like it doesn't make me it doesn't draw Mike into it. You know, like. No, not at all. Interesting. Mm-hmm. What a lot of people think is that there was another serial killer and that this theory would assume that Mike was also murdered or that he had fled and hadn't been found or seen. Pacific Northwest has lots of notable serial killers, and it's also got a lot of woods. Murders in the woods and dumping bodies in woods are not unique things. So it's possible that there could be other murders. You think, okay, tube sock being tied around the neck, that feels very unique. So the MO that they've established is that these women are found with tube socks around their neck when they've been murdered. They're in the woods and that the men that they had been with are not near them. Right. So, okay, we're talking about common elements and how one would investigate these overlaps, which, Amanda, do you know what that means? It's time to talk about my favorite thing. It's been so long since we've mentioned it, but it's time to talk about FICAP again. Okay, yes. It's, we're doing a refresher. If you've listened to us forever, then you've, you've heard me talk about FICAP before. But I like talking about it, and I'm fascinated by it and angered. That means we're going to talk about it just real quick. <laughs> yes. So what VICAP is, it's the Violent Crime Apprehension Program. What it's supposed to be is a repository slash database where data is collected for particular crimes so it can be cross-referenced so that like when you have these weird little facts, you can compare crimes with weird little facts like tube socks, if you will. Yeah. And so the particular crimes that are cross-referenced are homicides, missing persons, unidentified dead, sexual assaults, and then other violent crimes. And the information that they have, they aggregate in there are crime scene descriptions, victim and offender descriptive data, names and other personal identifying information about the victims, lab reports, criminal history records, court records, 
news media references, and crime scene photographs and statements, which some broad categories. Yes, yes. And so you're thinking, okay, they're going to pop these details into good old VICAP and find other murders because that is what they do in crime shows. But that doesn't really work for this, unfortunately, because VICAP wasn't established until 1985. So here we are in the first year of its inception. And as a general note, Amanda mentioned earlier truckers, but the Highway Serial Killer Initiative, it was in that initiative that VICAP was formed so that they could begin working on that to try to figure out people in different jurisdictions who are being murdered. Because here you were having all of these different police departments having very similar murders and never talking about it. Yeah. Connecting them because there were so many jurisdictional barriers and there still are. So there's this tool that could be used to identify murders or missing people or issues. And you would think, wow, what a tool. But you can go ahead and assume that in 1985, at its inception, it's very seldomly used by local police departments. VICAP is housed within the FBI, but it's for FBI, but also local law enforcement. Right. The police here could enter it in there. The other thing just to note, because it's a constant source of anger, is that it's not really used as much. There are, there are jurisdictions that are starting to mandate its usage. But as of 2015, less than 1% of police departments use this tool. It's infuriating. When you think about the things that you want police to be able to do, find people and solve murders seems very high on that list to me. Especially if it's already constructed in there to be used like it's not like they have to do anything fancy and like build their own yes it's literally there yeah it's learn how to use this tool great while this may not have been able to find a match for another murder right away it could be used over time so that you could look at some of the similarities in these cases say you're entering these cases say you're entering Stephen and ruth you would put the crime scene that they were camping you would put that when they got to the scene one person was found in their sleeping bag. You would put the cause of death, so that gunshot to the head. For Ruth, you would put that her body was found separate from her head. You would put that she had been shot in the abdomen. That tube sock would go in there. You know, that the fact that an animal was killed as part of this. There's a lot of details that you would put in there and cross-reference so that you could compare it to other cases. But here, the thing that they were looking at was there's a tube sock. That's it. What else is a tube sock? And that's where it feels like the analysis ended. Yeah, it does. I get that that's strange, but there's so many other factors in the case that maybe they do have overlap with other things. Easily identifiable other things. Yeah. But when we're doing episodes generally, we typically do our best to not just repeat what other people have said, because otherwise, what is the point of that episode? Yeah. <laughs> Great. There's not really any point. We're just repeating what is our ex- exists in the world. So we try to think like, okay, like, What are people not talking about? How can we talk about this in a different way? Or how can we analyze this in a more true creep style, if you will? We're picking things apart. And like, I wondered, are socks in murders really that unique? Because it's a common item. And if you think of murders and attacks and all of these things, it's not altogether strange that commonplace found items would be involved. Yeah. And it's also when you're thinking about socks in general, they are actually pretty widely used in both attacks and murders. When we were looking, we saw not many cases where they were being used as ligatures, probably because a sock is a bad ligature. Right. And the standard one isn't long enough. The standard one isn't long enough. And both of these victims were not murdered with a sock. The sock was just present. Right. Right. And I would even say, go so far as to say, like, it would be hard to to attempt to asphyxiate somebody with a tube sock. It's too thick and it's too, like, stretchy. Yeah. So stockings, that's not an uncommon thing because they can be kind of made more taut, if you will. Yeah. They're stockings that are used in murders. But also it's relatively common that socks are used as gags and that sometimes people are suffocating on those gags or that they are specifically suffocated with socks and that people use socks and then insert heavy thing inside to hurt people. They're used as a found object weapon. Yeah. And we've talked about it before being used in the mouth and things like that. Yeah. And so the more I like look into the tube sock murders, the more I go, is the tube sock what we should be paying attention to? Yeah. The only thing is, is it was strange that they weren't murdered with it. You know, like it it was an afterthought maybe or maybe to help control them more. I mean, I don't know why. Interesting. And I think that's the interesting part is because we have gunshots for Stephen and Ruth, right? And then for Diana, she's been stabbed 17 times. Those are vastly different murders. They are. 
They are for sure. The presence of a sock doesn't get rid of that. And often when you're looking at like somebody who's a serial killer, you're looking at people who are doing a similar thing. So the other fact that people are putting in this MO is that the men and women were separated. But I ask you, is that so strange? Because it's very common that in situations where a couple is attacked and the woman is sexually assaulted, the man will be incapacitated in some way. And whether that's by death or by being restrained can vary. But like that doesn't seem incredibly unique to me. No, it just seems like the thing you would have to do, especially if it's only one person doing these murders, you can't take on two people usually, easily at least. From a logistical perspective, it doesn't make sense. Exactly. So it feels like it would make sense. Yeah. If you're thinking this way of like, why were they separated? This would also explain why the dog was shot because he would be attacking the attacker. Or barking. Yeah. Yeah. And then also why the child wasn't hurt because Crystal likely wouldn't be attacking the attacker because she's like two. Right. It is interesting that they didn't hurt her. I think that's one of the strangest components of this was that she wasn't hurt, but I'm glad they didn't. Another weird element. When we're talking about these theories, it's just really interesting because it's like people are saying there's this one serial killer that's doing all these things. It might be Mike. Right. And so that's kind of like the big theory. We kind of frame those other parts to say like, okay, but does that theory make sense? And that's why we, you know, kind of got a little bit in the weeds about that MO. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And speaking of which, we also looked for other possible victims of this particular serial killer. Because, again, there's a lot of different tools out there to help link things together. And unfortunately, they're not always used. What we did is we looked at NamUs and we were trying to see if there's any other potential unidentified victims. And the parameters that we used were between the years 1975 and 1990. And then also we narrowed it to Pierce County because that's where these all happened, right? So because they are unidentified, right, we don't have names. So they are reduced to numbers at this point, which is really, really sad. Yeah. But the first one, the end numbers is 0714. And it's skeletal remains of a man who was about 20 to 25 years old when they were found. And they were found on March 25th of 1978 in Pierce County. He was estimated to have died between 1975 and 1978. He was approximately six feet tall, and he was found in what they describe as a, quote, wooded area. The skeletal pieces were found about 50 yards apart. So specifically, a skull with a brown braid, Mm -hmm. a mandible, a leg bone, pelvic bones, vertebrae, arm, hand bones that had a braided metal ring on one of the fingers, a clavicle, ribs, tibula, and teeth. So, like, that's a lot spread out. Yeah. To me, I think, like, animal, hopefully, like, that's what pulled it all apart, not a person. Yeah. But still very, very sad. So, another victim, their number ends in 306. On August 29th of 1978, the skull of a girl aged only 15 to 20 years old was found by a fisherman in Pierce County. So, the skull had long brown and blonde hair. Interesting. Two colors. Law enforcement searched the area after her skull was found and additional portions of her remains were found. So the remains of the girl were still clothed and what they found was a zip up sweater with pink shoulders and blue and white shoes. So not too much to go off of. Mm -hmm. And near her body, what they found were a pack of Marlboro cigarettes, blue denim pants, a green windbreaker jacket, and a multicolored girl's shirt. So far, like these people kind of fit the area and, you know, found in a wooded area specifically. Yeah. And we're finding people where you can't necessarily ascertain what the cause of death is. Mm -hmm. We don't know who they are. So we don't know when they went missing or from where. Yes. So like these could be people who went missing while camping. These could be people who were missing while on a similar road. Right. And similar time frame too. Mm -hmm. Yes. So another victim we're going to talk about Again, it like hurts my heart to just reduce them to numbers, but their numbers are 2244-10. I know, I know. The cranium of a woman plus a few bone fragments were found in a wooded area in Olympia, Washington on October 19th, 1981. Her age was estimated to be 20 to 30 years old, and she was thought to have died between 1966 and 1979. Near where her remains were found, someone has fashioned a cross with sticks and a shoestring. 
And then our last victim ends with 0201. And the remains of an 18 to 24 year old man were found in a wooded area near Carbon River Canyon. And that's close to the end of Tubbs Road in Pierce County. The skeletal remains were complete and fully clothed. The remains showed that the man had an extra right rib and extra vertebrae. Interesting. The remains were exhumed on March 11th, 2014 for DNA testing, but there wasn't a match with anyone. So again, all of these victims, there is slight potential that they could be connected because they do fall within some of the same parameters. Yeah. One of the reasons why we look is because, well, first off, new information is added to these all of the time. So it's not altogether strange to think that like something could be added, but also because if you don't know that your family member is missing, you don't know that you should be looking for them. And you certainly don't know that you should be looking for their remains. Yes. We've t- we talked about in other cases where a family member thought that the person just was like over them and moved out of their life. It's completely possible that their family lost touch with them and thought that that was the reason they weren't talking to them. Not that they, you know, were no longer alive. Exactly. Exactly. So to sum up, though, we, we were talking about some of the theories, right, of what or who could have been involved. And so let's sum up these theories. One, might kill Diana and is maybe a serial killer. Two, the unidentified and uninvited angry wedding guest had something to do with this. Again, that's like a big stretch for someone to like make their way to a wedding to like harass people, but okay. And then lastly, that there was another serial killer that murdered Stephen, Ruth, Diana, and possibly Mike. Yeah. And I mean, I feel like these are pretty wide theories. And yeah, they were there for a while because they had nothing else to go off of. Yeah. I mean, decades and decades until they could rule out at least one of them. Yes. And that's maybe Mike wasn't the person who was a serial killer because on March 26th of 2011, hikers found a partial skull on a logging road off Washington 7, just south of Elbe. And it's in relation to this skull that people, we start to kind of like get a more narrow view of where Diana's remains were found because she was found within a mile of him. So that's how we're better able to kind of like pinpoint their their locations because oftentimes you were just seeing like remote rural area, not necessarily where, because there's a lot of rural areas in that particular region. Yeah. And so testing confirmed that the skull that was found belonged to Mike. While death by gunshot in the head was ruled out, an examination of Mike's skull could not provide enough information for the coroner to determine his cause of death. What's interesting is that some people still think that he's responsible for Diana's murder or Diana's murder plus Stephen and Ruth and that he had taken his own life after and that like that's why they found his remains out there. I just find that hard to believe because I would imagine that all of these people who were searching on foot, on air, by car would have found him within a mile if he was that close to her at that point in time right it's worrisome that they didn't or my next question is was he not there at that time when we're talking about remains being this far spread out and not finding them it makes me think like okay are they not doing a thorough search but it could also be that they didn't die at the same time yeah so after the analysis of Mike's skull, the case goes completely cold and you don't hear more case information. You don't hear more suspects or, you know, anything other than a lot of conjecture from people, which I find utterly heartbreaking. Yeah, especially because there's so many lives there. So many lives and so many lives affected. So we normally try not to cover cases or topics where we don't have a ton of information to add or we're not like aggregating information in a different way. Or that we aren't going to put our unique true creep spin on. And we also talk about what we think happened. And I think, Amanda, correct me if I'm wrong, this is going to be the first episode where we actually don't talk about what we think happened. I think so. But we have our reasons. We have our reasons. We're going to talk about other circumstances in the next few months. When we're done, you'll wonder, huh, could it be this? When we're looking at the circumstances of these deaths, there is enough information about these that gives a whole ass other theory. It's one of the things that we didn't see anywhere else. We're not going to tell you what it is right now. It'll come in the next few months Mm -hmm. because it's a little bit more of a deeper dive and a heavier research lift. Before we started recording today, we looked like that meme. What is it from like, it's always sunny in Philadelphia with like all the strings and stuff. Yes. That's what we looked like trying to be like, yeah, how are we going to end this? Because we have so much more to share, but we're not ready to share all of it yet because we want to be very thorough. Yeah. And because it's more like if you lay out all of these facts 
and you look at them together in this different perspective, will you come to a different conclusion? Right. Right. And it's it's just a, a theory, too. It's another theory. It's not anything for sure. But we have strong feelings. Yeah. Yeah. And facts. There's some facts that can support it. Again, thank you, Mary, for suggesting this case. It's leading to so much now. <laughs> Very fascinating to research. And it's also it gave me a different perspective on the weight of novel evidence in a murder. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Because we're like a tube sock. It, it has to be connected. And then it's like, but wait a second. There's a lot of factors. How do you weigh them? That's true. We love when people give us recommendations. So please give us recommendations. We also love our Patreons. Also, feel free to join our absolutely free Bat Bonfire on Facebook. With that, have a great weekend. Thanks for creeping with us. Thanks for listening. And as always, a special thank you to our patrons who support us via Patreon. Please see the link in our show notes to learn more about how you, yes, you, can begin to haunt the dump, guard vortexes, or even become a scorching Sasquatch. Also in our show notes, you can find the link to our website, more information on our sources, our social media handles, and our merch store. We'd love for you to keep creeping with us. So if you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, review, and share the show with your fellow creeps and or ghosts. I beg of you. (laughs) Well, here's the thing. I am currently 36, and the idea of dating someone who's 17... Sounds like an actual nightmare. It really does. It sounds awful. In addition to being like objectively disgusting because one person's a child and one person's an adult, like the idea of being romantically involved with a person who has the maturity of a 17 year old at while I'm at my age sounds (laughs) unbearable. Like, (laughs) (laughs) well, she's also in the era of kids get off my lawn, right? Me? Oh, yeah. I mean, Yeah, old lady. Yeah, I'm completely... Actually, no, that's Ben. That's Ben. Because, like, our neighbors will sometimes, like, like a ball will come into our yard and he's, like, like hissing kind of. I mean, not really. But, like, I'm, like, it's fine. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. He likes kids, too. He's great with kids. But anytime there's a possibility of anything touching his Hyundai Santa Fe, he gets really upset. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, she... Like, he makes you, like, do a circle before you get into it. It's a bit much. It's a bit much. I appreciate him appreciating his things. Read into that silence. Just go ahead. Anyway. All right. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about this. That'll be in the tangents. Okay. (laughs) Won't it? Won't it? Have you seen the horror stories of what is inside the trees when you just like go cut them down and bring them in? Lots of spiders. Like a ridiculous amount. Have you ever experienced that? Luckily, no. So my parents have... And that's why they don't do that. Because my dad's also like, he does not do spiders. He does not do spiders. So they're like driving down the road. It's tied to the roof of their van. And my mom's like, she like looks up. Like she goes to light. I think she goes to light her cigarette. And when she lights her cigarette, she just sees something moving. And she figures out what it is like very quickly and is like, Rick, don't look up. Oh, I think you've said this before. Yeah. Because she knows he's scared of spiders. Yeah. She's like, Rick, don't look up. And then he's like, what do you mean? She's like, just don't look up. Don't look up. You don't need to do that. Which, of course, means like, what are you going to do then? Yeah, you look up immediately. Mm-hmm. You're going to look up. You're going to look up. And so <laughs> he looks up and there's like thousands of baby spiders just everywhere. That car would have been left. And that is their car now. It's a miracle that they didn't die in that car after that. Because like, I think I'd be in an accident. I Yeah, like... I would just abandon it. Like, that is the spider's car now. It lives on the side of the road. <laughs> That's your spider. That's your car now. Well, I mean, but all, but okay, in theory, the idea of a lovely little, like, the sump pump, is it always going? Yes. It's rainy and gross here today, though. And a little bit of snow. But rain? What are rain? Rain. <laughs> what are rain? What are snow? Uh, but in theory, in idea alone... The idea of going and just cutting down your own Christmas tree sounds like a delightful little time. Yeah. Yeah. Like a nice day. Yeah. That immediately makes me nervous, by the way, like that you're just gonna be like, whose kid is this? They have to show proof. I know. But we're not talking about now. We're talking about back then. That's true. The 1980s. And I just like very much imagine like a little like police station. And they're like, who wants a kid? You know? Yikes. I don't imagine that they're like, do you have pictures of you with them? Do you have like, insert this documentation? 
I, I don't know how to yeah. I don't trust police in the eighties. Notice that pause. Can you read in? Can you read into things? I can. I can. Can you read into two two statements there? I was gonna say, like even nowadays, like returning a lost dog requires more. Oh, oh, like more proof. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, like if I found someone's dog, well, tiny cat, she's ours. She's chipped. She's ours. She was found with child. She's le- she was less than a year, a teenage mother living on the streets, and with her tiny baby, who is not home yet, but will be living with us. Well, living with us. He's our baby as well, Theo. But I remember, like, we were like, oh, what if they scan her and she's someone's? And I was like, oh, she's not now. Now she's ours. Like, you let, you put your teenage cat, you put your pregnant cat outside to go have a baby off on her own. Or you, or you let a kitten outside. Yeah. Either way, as a cat mom, unfit, unfit for where I live. I mean, they are escape artists in some yeah capacity, but no, I agree. It's but for where I live, like there's too many major streets where if you're letting them outside, like they simply like they Beller can't. Road is very close to me, and if you're from Maryland, you know that's a busy road. So it's just no. But I would not give her back. That's going in the end because it's not even relevant here. I just need to bring Tiny Cat up all the time. I love her and her Christmas tree shenanigans, and that like. Other names have been given and they do not stick. To, it's just Tiny Cat. No other name. I like it. I mean, I ha- also have a Tiny Cat. I wonder if they're about the same size. She is. No, she's smaller. Because she... Mara is this big. Mara weighs six pounds or five pounds. She looks like she's more substantial, though. Like, she looks... Mara looks like she's grown into that age. She's doofy looking like a kitten. And we don't know if she's going to grow. Like, she might not ever get Mara- bigger than she is. Loki's age and is oh more than half his size. I'll tell you what her weight is when we wear because I want to start weighing her regular. We'll have to see because yeah, uh, they they were suspecting she might be one of the Munchkin cats. I think is what they call it, little babes, because she's so mm. itty bitty, little tiny leg out. We are using the power of AI to tell you that one, the automatic transcription transcribed little tiny gal is little tiny leg out, and two, that Theodore is now home. We'll be sharing photos of him on our Instagram. Okay, this is another power of AI moment. Simply to say that AI Lindsay is absolutely terrifying. Livy makes up stories about anything you'll give her an opportunity to. And she'll make it up and she'll tell you as though it's fact. Well, it is in her head. I showed her a picture of me as a child and she was like, oh, da, 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 da. I like, I was like, that's me. <laughs> she had like a whole story about like this girl in her life and what she went on to do. You need to be recording those and just make a little book of her stories. All the time. All the time. Also, not to just bring up Moose snoring again, but she's now dreaming. So if you hear what sounds like a monkey laughing, it is Moo barking in her sleep. Poor baby. I hope it's a good dream. She doesn't bark in real life. So it's just her dream barks. That's cute. Ollie woke up sick today. And so now I'm like afraid. I want to say like Bullard because we have a street called Bullard. We're making our bed. We're nesting. Pride has made her so chunky, Amanda. Chunky girl. She loves having a blanket on her bed, but it does mean that she's got a root for a second. Oh, well, yeah. Just make it cozy. Get comfy. Oh, there you go. Nudia. Nudia. Okay, my brain. My brain got there. And also, I do want to point out that a lot of people hear Discord and they're like, I'm not doing another app. I'm not doing it. I don't want to. It's not for me. And I also felt the same way. And then my husband like dragged me kicking and screaming to Discord because it's just easier to chat on. And now I am so evangelical about it. It's very helpful. You can also organize things into conversations. So we have like 20 conversations going at once. <laughs> up, 20. Com- we have like a place to talk about the new episodes. There's a spot where you can talk about the spooky things you're shopping for. Are you looking for the person or people? To, are you looking for the people to send the TikToks to that you find? We're your people. It's in our Discord. We're your people. So... That's my Discord pitch. 